Learning has been around for a long time. So long, in fact, that it's easy to take learning for granted and how amazing and wonderful it really is. How long has learning been around? Well, if we go back a long time into the past, let's say 3.5 billion years ago, we see a planet cloaked in a red haze of methane. Not much life here, not much oxygen. But it's not long after this that we begin to see in the fossil record evidence of bacteria. And after a billion or so more years, we see evidence of cyanobacteria, an important single-celled organism that produces oxygen and help to transform our hostile red planet into a life-supporting blue one able to support the myriad of life forms that we see around us today. As well as oxygen, cyanobacteria generate stony mushroom-shaped structures in the oceans called stromatolites. They do this when they excrete dust and dirt as a result of the processes whereby they absorb nutrients from the sea. And here's an example of a fossilised one. Now I'd like to say that I went all the way to Morocco to produce this, it is from Morocco to find this, but actually you can pick these up as I did in the market in the centre of uh, Bristol. And you find these fossils over a billion years old sometimes, so they've been around for a very long time. And the really interesting thing, and this is the reason why I'm telling you about cyanobacteria, is that they have an ability to learn, because cyanobacteria are still here today. And we can see that they are able to vary the rate at which they absorb nutrients based on how much they've already eaten. And that's important for the survival of cyanobacteria to make sure they don't eat too much or too little. So life has been learning and remembering about as long as life existed. So what's the big deal? Why get excited about learning, something that's been around for, for so long? Well, if I had to sum up in one word what makes education exciting for me, it would be transformation. Even an organism comprising a single cell seems to be able to learn, and it can only learn through some sort of biological change occurring. In other words, the memory of having eaten needs to be stored somewhere in the cell, in this case, because the organism is only comprising one cell. Of course, in our brains, we have 86 billion cells, so learning is a lot more complex, and yet the same principle applies to humans. The oddest thing, you see, is that you're not quite the same person as you were a few moments ago. You have a memory of what you were doing before you started playing this video. You have a memory of me picking up that fossil. And these memories have joined others that must be held somewhere in your biology for you to be able to carry them around with you and to preserve them. You carry this world of memory around in your body and principally, of course, your brain. So something must change. If only in small ways that we can't see, learning must operate by literally transforming us, both mentally but also biologically. And in bigger ways too. Learning a new idea, for example, can sometimes transform a person's view of themselves and what's around them. And when this idea spreads, it can transform others until the whole world appears to have changed. So that transformation of the world at a personal but also at a global level, is the amazing thing about learning and what we call education, which is basically our organised attempt to generate learning. And this transformation relies on plasticity. Now, what do we mean by plasticity? Well, the brain is plastic. Now, obviously, this brain is plastic. It's actually made of plastic. But, but we also say that our biological brain is plastic, because plastic actually means mouldable, changeable. Our brains must be able to change in response to the environment if we are to learn. So we don't just use our brains to learn. Learning actually changes our brains as we learn. The course that you're embarking on soon 
the course that you are beginning now will change your brain. It will change your biology. And it's going to start happening quite soon. In fact, if you ever remember watching this video, it's already started happening. And within a few weeks, if we put you in a brain scanner, some of these changes might even be visible. We know from studies using neuroimaging that over just a few weeks of intensive study, the brain can change not only just its function, but also its structure. In other words, the relative size and shape of the different parts that make it up. In one such study, the brains of medical students were scanned before carrying out an intensive three-month period of daily study for an exam. They were scanned again a couple of days after the exam, and then a third time three months following the exam. Immediately after the exam, it was shown that large regions of the parietal lobes had increased their grey matter. These parietal lobes are more at the rear of your brain. And in these sections through the brain, we see parts of the hippocampus has also increased. That's a part of the brain that has general importance for making our learning more permanent. Interestingly, the hippocampus did not show its full increase in size immediately after the exam. It reached a new maximum three months later, which the researchers blame on stress. The hippocampus is sensitive to stress, and I think that there may be an important message here about managing your work in the months to come, so you don't have too many periods of having to work late into the night when approaching deadlines. It's true that some types of mild stress can be good for learning, but it's rarely good when the stress becomes intense. And here is another example. A study done by Eleanor Maguire on the brains of taxi drivers showed that the size of one region of the hippocampus, again that's that region that's very important for making memory more permanent, was proportional to how many years of experience the taxi driver had navigating around the streets of London. And here perhaps is an even more dramatic example. The size of the brain regions indicated here by the hotspots in this image are all related to social memory, your ability to recall details of relationships and issues involving your friends and those that you know socially. The size of all of these regions can be, to some extent, predicted by the number of friends that you have on your social media sites. Scientists believe that this is another example of plasticity. The brain has changed, it does change, in response to demands that are placed on it. Now, some might be horrified by this. It's clear evidence, isn't it, that Facebook is changing the brains of young people, changing the brains of all of us. Shock horror. Well, not really shocking and not really horrifying, of course. This is exactly what you would expect. We know that our brain responds to changes in the environment. We know that our brain changes when it learns. The structure changes, the function changes, the connectivity between neurons in the brain changes. All of these things happen to allow us to adapt to new learning challenges. And if you're having to increase your social network or you, you want to increase your social network and you're having to remember lots of new information about all these new people in your life, then that is going to exercise particular regions of your brain that are then going to increase in size as a result. So an important message overall here, perhaps the most important message, is that your brain, because it changes, it doesn't provide some fixed biological limit to what you can achieve. It doesn't limit our capacity for learning. It should be seen as a potential that enables our capacity to learn. The things that we decide to do, the experiences that we open ourselves up to, such as choosing to study the course that you're about to begin, that makes a big impact on how our brain develops and our capacity for learning. In effect, we have a big role in constructing our own brains and our own abilities. 
you've already made a major decision that will have a significant impact on your brain development by choosing to study your course. And you'll have more decisions along the way that will affect and develop your brain and your abilities to learn. So go ahead and challenge yourselves. Ask questions during lectures about what puzzles you, about what interests you. Approach the things that you don't understand and examine them. Don't avoid them. Get stuck in. Pull ideas apart. See what makes them tick. Become critical thinkers and creative thinkers. Developing your own ideas and your own direction. And build your own brain.